Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Bao, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. It's nice to see a couple of new faces and a couple of familiar faces here. Um, so Sam agreed to share the slides for me, so I have to ask him to forward again and again because I have lots of animation. Sam, thank you for doing this. Um, so what I'm talking about is really a decade of what we call kilometer scale climate modeling. Many people refer to this also to convection permitting, cloud resolving, storm resolving, all of those things often mean the same thing. It's running numerical models um, at something like a few kilometer grid spacings. Um, I, I like to start off with, with this background image. This is, first of all, it's a really beautiful thunderstorm. Uh, but secondly, you see the Denver skyline in the lower left corner here. Um, and it's really giving you a good perspective of how massive these storms are and how beautiful they are. And some, some of my talks will touch upon how we simulate these kind of storms in a, in a very bulk sense, I would say. Um, next, please. So um, this is really a, a, a rough overview of all the simulations that we have performed over the years. Um, starting really more than 10 years ago with this orange box over the Colorado headwaters. Uh, so fairly small domain. We always use the wolf model, um, still using the wolf model um, until now, but we also look at to using MPAS into the future. Um, this Colorado headwater domain was really focused on understanding how these models are, are simulating primarily the snowpack and precipitation over, over the mountains and how this might change in the future. This was quite successful, um, these simulations. And based on the success, we really tried to expand the domain and go to longer time periods. And this is what we did when we got a new supercomputer. This was Yellowstone at, at, at NCAR. This is on the light red domain, which we call CONUS-1. So this time we really simulated all of the CONUS um, and adjacent watersheds. And this allowed us also to look more, much more into convective um, precipitation and convective processes in the eastern U.S. Um, currently, we're working on a couple of things, um, mainly the CONUS 404, which is the same domain, the light red domain. This is a, I think, 42-year reanalysis downscale simulation, which down, downscales ERA 5. I will show a couple of results there as well. Most of these simulations are reanalysis downscaled. We we have for all of them, we have future climate simulations as well, which I will not focus on. So I will not really focus on climate change effects um, and how they are simulated here just because of time issues. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions if there, if you have, if you're curious about specific things. We also simulate over South America now, which is the biggest domain that we're running currently. And I will also not show South American results. I just want to say, the reason why we went to South America was really we did a lot of model improvements over North America over the last 10 years. And we wanted to see if those improvements are still helping us to better simulate the water cycle in South America. And they, they do. So that's that's very encouraging that we can use similar setups for North and South America, because the end goal here is really, a, this, this is maybe coming back to Andrew Gettleman's talk, to go to global scales, Earth system model coupled simulations within hopefully the next 10 years. Next. So just a quick outline. I structured this talk in four main elements. The first one is summer precipitation and land atmosphere coupling. Next. Then also orographic precipitation in more in, in winter in the Western US. Next. I wanted to talk touch briefly on this issue of model biases versus observational uncertainties, which I think is very interesting. And next, lastly, just showing you where the future might be for these kilometer scale modeling applications. Next, so, but we start here with really the summertime first. Next, sorry for like, letting you click so often. <laughs> Sam, you do a great job. So summertime precip, that, that's a long-standing area of issue in climate models and also weather models. I'm, probably many of you will be familiar with this CASAS project. It was initiated in um, the early 2015s or 10s. Um, and this was really an international project with the goal to understand where these warm and dry biases are coming from that are very systematic in many cl climate and weather forecasting models in the central US during summertime. And you see this in the blue box here. Um, so this is a multi-model mean from CMIP-5 
Um, and basically this, this project concluded that it, it's really a failure of these models to simulate organized convection and the clouds that are associated with them. I come back to that in a minute. These are mesoscale convective systems, basically. Next, so a couple of years later, another CMIP cycle, CMIP6. This is what the CMIP6 models look like. Um, I would say there's not a lot of progress with these biases. Um, there's another paper by the same group which tried to look into these processes again, and I think they have a better understanding now where they're coming from, and they are now talking more about soil atmosphere coupling and how this relates to rainfall in this region in, in summer season. Um, and I will now really focus into this, this specific issue in the central U.S. Um, warm season. Next. So this is a typical um, satellite image that you can get for almost every day in the central U.S. during the summertime. These are geostationary satellite um, observations of the cloud field and the, the yellow dots are lightning strikes. And what you can see here, that this MCS, this organized system, just disappeared, but there's another one spinning up. There's a line of convection spinning up over the Great Lake region now, for example. And there's another one coming in from Colorado, going into the plains here, for example. So these MCSs are really the dominant weather features in the central U.S. during, during the warm season. Next. If you think about how climate models, coarse resolution climate models, are parameterizing deep convection. It's often looking something like that. This famous paper by Arakawa and Schubert, where you think you have a grid box, a large grid box, and then you have a population of clouds that pop up in this grid box. This is typically what you would maybe, maybe want to see or expect to see in the tropics. This is, if you click next, this is not what we see here. Like what we see here is definitely not this. It's much more organized. These systems can be thousands, thousand kilometer broad that have very large organized convective areas. So these, these deep convective schemes don't work for those, um, those systems at all. Next. However, simulating the systems is really crucial because more than 50% of the central US precipitation annually is coming from MCSs. And the lower figure in the lower right is showing you that especially the tropics are dominated by MCS precipitation. So the point here is really if you cannot simulate MCSs correctly, you will very likely have large biases in your global simulations and regional simulations on, on all kinds of timescales coming from forecasts to um, decadal and um, climate projections. Next. And please interrupt if you have any questions. I'm happy to take questions in between as well. So what we what we did here in an idealized study is we looked at how MCSs are simulated in three atmospheric regimes that are different than how we treat turbulence. So the top figure is basically showing you the turbulence energy spectrum. So how much energy there is in turbulent motion in the atmosphere um, from Weingart 2014. And you can see that we have roughly three regimes here. The mesoscale limits is, is on the left. This is basically where, you, where we have to use deep convection parameterizations because we don't resolve most like we don't resolve uh, turbulent motions at all. Then we go into this terra incognita, or this gray zone of convection or turbulence. This is basically where we operate this kilometer scale models in, where the largest overturning circulation and turbulent motions are resolved, but most of them are not. And this that's a tricky area to simulate because we don't have a good theory of how to treat turbulent motions in this terra incognita region. And then, of course, you can push it even further um, the, the grid spacing to high and high resolution, and you go to the LES limit, and then you explicitly resolve deep convective motions. So if you click next, these are wolf simulations, idealized wolf simulations that are uh, provided um, pre-MCS sounding, and then you basically trigger convection and see what's happening. And this is what you get from a 12 kilometer grid spacing model. And we use the kind fridge scheme here, but you can turn it off. It looks very similar. What you see is very disappointing if you simulate MC or if you're interested in MCSs because this is a single cell thunderstorm that just gets affected by the flow. So this is nothing what we what I would refer to as an MCS. If you click next, if you go to four kilometers, so now we're turning off the deep convection scheme, you get really a regime shift in how you simulate these kind of systems. So you see you you, you get a cold pool. This cold pool, this frontal zone is triggering more and more updrafts and the cloud shield, the movement of the system, everything is very different compared to 12. So there's really a regime shift and a step improvement, I would say, if you go from 12 to 4 kilometers. It's not perfect, but you get a lot of benefits if you go from 12 to 4 kilometers or 3 kilometers. Next, we can, of course, go to higher and higher resolution. 
the trade-off here is really like resolution is one of the most expensive things that you can change in your model. If you double the resolution, you have approximately 10 times the computational resources that you have to provide for the same simulation. So this one kilometer basically shows you that you see smaller updrafts, everything is a little bit finer resolved, but overall, like the, the larger picture here is quite similar to four. So you get benefits, but not as much as if, if you go from 12 to four. And if you go next, really going down to more the LES scale now, you see again, like a similar structure of a system. The big difference here is if you just look at the cloud top, you can immediately see the, all the turbulence, the shading that you get, like you really resolve lots of turbulence here. And one kilometer is very laminar, but in the bulk sense, these systems are still fairly similar. So the, the main point here is really if you go to these kilometer scale grid spacings, you get a lot of benefits concerning the computational resources that you have to invest. We will not be able to run global climate simulations at 200 meter for a very long time. Um, but kilometer scale is, is, I think, within reach in the next couple of years. Next. And these results are not only like this is central US sounding, but you can see similar things from weather forecasting in other regions. So this is, for example, from the UK Met Office. Uh, the left picture is showing you a radar image of an it's, it's a fairly small MCS if, if you compare those to the U, uh, US, but you can clearly see this organized convective system here over southern southern England. And then you see how this was forecasted in one point, the 1.5 kilometer forecast and the 25 kilometer forecast. And you can see 25, it misses the event completely. So again, like you see many of those um, examples with different models in different regions. So that's a fairly robust improvement that you get if you go to this kilometer scale modeling systems, that you get this organized convection, even single cell convection, um, much better than if you would use um, a coarse resolution model. Next. So we were very excited <clears throat> at NCAR. We, we got a new computer system. This was a Yellowstone. Got lots of resources and we thought, okay, we, we will simulate the whole US and the MCSs will look great. And so what we did here, what I did in this paper, I looked at the central US, this is the red box in, in this inlet here. And I counted how many MCSs, I tracked MCSs and I counted how many MCSs do you, MCSs do you get over a 13 year period. So this is multi-year average here. And you can see like in summertime, June, July, August, you have with the peak season, almost every day you get an MCS. If you do next, the simulation, we were really happy with the simulation uh, for the early season. So we got almost the exact number of MCSs up to June. This is reanalysis downscaled, I have to say that. If you click next, but then in July, August, September, <laughs> we were very disappointed because this is even worse almost than what if what you get with a 12 kilometer model. So we only had a third maybe of the MCSs that we observe. If you click next, um, coming back to this causes project, and I think you have to click a couple of times next here, we, we have the same, yeah, not one more time. We have the same or even worse warm biases in these simulations, even if we downscale reanalysis data. And this is actually also using a spectral nudging of large scales. So we really constrain the simulation. Still, we get massive warm biases, six degrees partly in the central US and associated dry biases as well. So we, we can, went out and tried to understand what's happening. We had many theories. Most of us, as you can imagine, then car, like we were atmospheric modelers. If you click next, the first idea was, of course, like this could be aerosols. Aerosols could, should cool down this region, and we treated aerosols pretty um, rudimentary in, the, in our simulation. So we tested this, and aerosols actually they cool down the region, but they're not the driving force. If you do next, so it's not aerosols. One more time, next. Okay, shallow convection. Shallow convection is something we don't do well, and we notice in these kilometer scale models. But next, it's also not shallow convection. It cools down the region a little bit, but not a lot. Boundary layer scheme. Yeah, of course, the boundary layer, the, 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 this turbulent motion in the boundary layer is not well simulated. Wolf offers you a large variety of boundary layer schemes. They don't really affect this as, as well. Like next, so you, it's also not the boundary layer. You want to do one more time next. What it, basically the main contributor to this bias is soil atmosphere coupling. And what's happening here is um, in the central US, you, you always picture the central, at least I do, I picture it very flat. It's not flat, it's hilly. And this is what you see here in this, in this graphic. This is the depth of the water table. So basically the shallow groundwater, how far do you have to dig down to get to water? And you can see all this 
small river valleys in the central US in the upper plains. And those are the areas which evaporate a lot because vegetation can reach the, like the, the water in these areas. If you do next, we actually did simulations early on with using um, a shallow groundwater scheme in Wolf. Um, next, there should be a plot coming up on the right. And if you, if you- It's not advancing. Oh, there we go. I'm still, oh yeah, now it's there. Um, so basically we did experience with a 30 kilometer wolf. We wrote a paper about this and it cooled down the region by one degree. It wasn't a lot. So we basically said, this is probably not a big impact that we see, but if we used it in the four kilometers, it has a massive impact on rainfall and precipitation. And the reason is shown in this right graph. So basically what you see here on the X axis is how deep the, the water table depth is in the central US. And basically there's almost no grid cells with a water tables beneath five meters. So it's fairly deep because you don't sim like resolve this mesoscale river valleys. But in the four kilometers, it's, which is in the vertical axis, you see there's lots and lots of grid cells. So those are all the areas which you can evaporate very eff eff um, efficiently. So if you click one more time next. So the process is really shown here. What's, what's the key process? You have to resolve the, the river, uh, the, the, the valleys in, in this region, and then you get a lateral hill slope flow. So you basically get a deeper groundwater table at the, at the hilltops and the water is running into the valleys. So this is what you have to simulate. If you do this next, so we rerun our simulations. And if you click next, this is shown in this Balage paper, you almost eliminate the warm bias completely. And if you click next, if you run this MCS tracker again, this is just for one year, but you see now we are really following the observations very nicely. So that, that has a massive impact on, on the hydrologic climate in the central US if you include this uh, hydrologic flow in the subsurface or not. And I think that this, this also should have big implications for seasonal forecasting as well. If you, if you don't resolve this, like these, but these biases emerge very quickly. After a couple of weeks, if you start in April, May, you run into this warm biases if you don't, if you don't um, simulate this shallow groundwater flow. Next. And like there are other modeling studies that showed something similar. This is just one example from Linda Schlemmer um, in, in Europe. They used a different modeling system, but found basically the same thing. So this is the default setting. This is also what we have default in Wolf. This is this open lid. Basically, if the water infiltrates into the surface, if it reaches the lowest soil, like soil level, it's gone. So you lose the water. And this is what the biases look like. If you click one more time, if, if they basically seal the surface and they allow lateral flow, uh, the biases in, in winter time, which are on the top, in the summertime, in the bottom, especially in Eastern Europe, which is probably the most similar region to the central US and Europe, are largely improved. If you click one more time, you can see the differences. So this seems to be a process that's very important in many regions of the world. And I can think about others, like, for example, the Sahel region, definitely in Southeast Asia, where, where this, this should be very important to, to incorporate. Next. So this is just showing you an animation of the cloud field that we get now. So we, we included this, this um, groundwater flow into the latest version of the simulations, the wolf simulations that we did over Konos, what we call Konos 440. So this 40 year reanalysis driven simulations. And like one of these two figures is showing you observations from geostationary satellites. The other one is the wolf model. And, it's, it's really striking how similar they are. Again, like we use spectral nudging to get the systems in the right place, but also only large scales. Uh, if you click next to the left, left one, if you're wondering, is the model, the right one is, is the geostationary satellite. Next. So what, what I also wanted to highlight here, like this, these projects really focused on the central US, but just look at the Western US. Like that's a hot mess. Like you get way too much precipitation and it's, it's way too cold in all of these models, very systematic again. And I just wanted to, to show what these high resolution models are doing there, if you click one more time. So now what I'm showing you is the thermal cycle, again, in the, in, the, in the warm season, in the summer season, for all these grid cells or the stations uh, that we have in the Western US, which are shown in this inlet as purple dots. And the general cycle of rainfall, the left one is showing you the amount, the black line is the co-op station. So these are the observations. And then 
I overlaid a couple of simulations that we did with the Wolf model, it's 36 kilometers, and we tested lots of physics. The main um, impact on the neural cycle that you can achieve at this grid spacings is typically with the deep convection scheme. So we used three different deep convection schemes, kind, rich, TTK, and NSAS. And you see all of that they are producing different cycles, but they have the same biases. If you can, you go back. Yes, yeah, sorry. So they have the same biases. They have this early peak in, of, of rainfall, which is very typical for all these, like almost all models that use a deep convection scheme. And then they have a massive overestimation coming back to this wet bias that I explained before. Like this amount of the rainfall amount bias is really a product of the frequency and the intensity bias that you see here. So what, it, what this actually is, is you get rainfall almost every day. So you get very frequent rainfall, but the intensity is way too low compared to observation. So this is often referred to this drizzling bias. And again, like this, you can find this in almost all models that use deep convection schemes. If you click one more time, this is what this new Conus 404 simulations look like in the same region. Uh, the blue line actually here is era five. So this is the, the latest reanalysis, um, best reanalysis, I guess, that we have. And you still see these issues in the reanalysis because they use a deep convection scheme, I would assume. Um, and the, the model is not perfect, but it's largely eradicating these biases. So the red line is this Conus 404 simulation. So much better simulation of, of um, the, the warm season climate in the Western US as well. Next. And just to, to make this point as well, um, also extreme rainfall gets way better simulated by this high resolution simulations. This is shown here, uh, different sub panels for different regions. The left one, the big one is for all the stations that we have over Konos, the co-op stations. The black line again is the Konos, the co-op stations. So you see this long tail, very heavy rainfall, 100 millimeters and above. Uh, ERA 5 has very, very weak rainfall. Like, this is exact, exactly what you would expect from a coarse resolution model. Um, the red line is the Konos 404 simulation, and then we added um, observational data set, which is uh, called ARC or the analysis of record. This is um, produced by NOAA. And you can see like the Konos 404, this is normally a one, one kilometer grid, a one kilometer data set, which, which is provided hourly, the ARC. And still you can see this Conus simulation is really outperforming ARC because like the, the real resolution of this data set is probably way, way coarser than one kilometer. It's basically just the nominal grid spacing is one kilometer, but the resolution is probably somewhere about 12 to 20 kilometers. So the model is doing a really good job in capturing extreme events. So the PDF of hourly rainfall rates um, over the US in different regions. Next. So going on to the second piece, the winter precipitation and snowpack dynamics, next. So we, we are really blessed in the United States with, with a very nice observational network that we have, which is called Snowtel. Um, these are all the Snowtel sites that we have in the Western US. Um, they are really strategically placed at locations where you have a, like the maximum snowpack accumulation. So this, this network is really supporting the monitoring of the snowpack and, of course, sequentially um, water resource predictions for the Western US um, through the, the melt off of the snow in later season. Next. So this is just an example picture of how one of these snow tail sites looks like. Um, you see lots of sensors. We have multiple sensors that measure snow and precipitation. So that's very nice because you can compare like, for example, the, the precipitation gauge measurement with the snow pillar measurement and see how well they agree. Um, all of these are in forest clearings. So that, that's mainly strategically that the wind driven snow under catch is not as severe. Um, but as you see, like very nice instrumentation. What I also want to point out, there's a temperature sensor on this tower as well. And I will come back to this temperature later on in the talk uh, just to highlight the we also measure temperature at these stations. Next. So if you, this is for the Colorado Rockies now. So if you just look at an average season, this is 2007, 2008, the water, uh, water year starting from the 1st of November till May. And what, what's shown here is what we observe with the prism data set, like these are the dots and the snow tail data. And the snow tail data goes into prism. So it's not surprising that those two agree. 
if you click one more time, so this is basically just the accumulated rainfall over time. This is what you get if you use a 36 kilometer version of Wolf over the Colorado headwaters. So what, what basically you get a large underestimation of, of rainfall in these locations. What this actually does, it's, it's, it's dumping way too much rain into the valleys and way too little onto, onto the mountains. But if you increase the grid spacing, if you go next to 18 kilometers, next six kilometers or two kilometers, if you click one more time, you see we're really approaching the observations very, very nicely. So once you get to this kilometer scale grid spacings, you get the precipitation very nicely simulated in this, at least in the Colorado headwaters. And of course, this has major application implications for uh, precipitation amount of pat amounts and patterns in mountains, but also snowpack dynamics and large benefits for hydrology and snow glacier modeling later on. Next. So we also simulate the snowpack dynamics and we can look at those um, accumulation and, and depletion of snowpack, the melting off of the snowpack in different regions. This is what I'm showing you here. Um, these are the solid lines. And basically what I wanted to highlight here, the snowpack is quite okay simulated. So depending on which region you look at, so it's, it's well simulated, but we systematically underestimate the peak snowpack and we, we're still not understanding why. That, that's not a pure resolution issue. If you go to one kilometer resolution, you get a similar bias. So we are still trying to figure out why we don't get the right snowpack accumulation. It's probably 20% 20, 20 too low on average. Next. Um, hey, I'm going yeah. to give them a five minute warning. Oh, five minutes. Okay, let me see. Probably have to jump over a couple of things then. Um, okay, let me do this and then I jump to the end. Um, the, the main reason why we get this improvement is really the flow orography inter, inter, or, or, or interaction that you much better simulate at, at high resolution than in low resolution. So this is a nice field campaign study that they had in 1982 in the top right where they flew aircrafts um, during atmospheric river events in the Sierra Nevada. And what they basically observed is a cross barrier jet. This is what you see here with 25. This is moisture flux um, along the barrier. And the lower left figure is basically showing you how this looks like in our simulation. So we also get this along barrier flow along the Sierras because the, the flow is blocked. But then what you also can see is that the flow is going through these gaps in the mountains. If you click one more time, this is then really producing this patchy signal of precipitation that we also observe where you get higher precipitations in high elevation and then lower precipitation in these gaps in the mountains. If you click one more time, this is basically how this cross barrier jet looks like in our simulations. And it's, it's fairly comparable to what they observed in the 80s. So we're very, very happy with those. Um, next. I would say I ch jump over this. Can you go, I will basically jump over the whole observational uncertainty part here. And can you go to slide, let's see what it is, 30? Oh yeah, future direction, perfect. Yeah, next. So I just wanted to, to, to talk about where we're going with this now. Um, and I think this is really what probably touching on what Andrew Gettleman um, talked about as well. The, the vision is really to have global convection permitting modeling capabilities. Um, and I think those are really within reach. If you click one more time, these are just a couple of projects from major modeling centers international that work at the same at the same strategy, I would say, to, to make this a reality, to make this um, kilometer scale earth system models um, operational within the next couple of years. Next. So this is the NK effort that we have. This is the system for integrated modeling of the atmosphere, SEMA. Um, basically what we do here, we use the CSM, the community earth system model framework, but we make it very modular. So what you can do in here, you can select different dynamical cores. Like the, those are the green cycles below. Um, you could select MPAS or FV3, for example. Um, it's all coupled to data assimilation and then you can couple um, different physics to this um, dynamical cores, like the wolf physics, the cam physics, or the deep atmosphere physics, for example. And all of that is coupled to other earth, earth system component components through the SEMA network, um, which is basically coupled to ocean, land, ice, and et cetera. Um, next. I don't have to explain you, this to you, I guess. Like this is the new structure of the WCRP. Um, Cliver is down there underneath uh, Click and GWAX. 
as one of the core projects. Um, I wanted to highlight the, the Lighthouse activities in here, if you click one more time. And this is basically what Andrew Gettleman talked about. So we have five of those. I'm involved in this Digital Earth Lighthouse activity on the top right, if you click one more time. Like this Lighthouse activities are really aimed to make critical near-term progress to, to support or meet the vision of WCRP in the next couple of years, five to 10 years. If you click next, the Digital Earth is really focused on building this um, integrated modeling systems, integrated interactive digital information systems um, that provide global regional information on past, present, and future of our planet and our human system. So it's really not only the, the natural system that we are interested, in, but also the human interactions with the natural system here. Next. I just wanted to briefly highlight, we have this convection permitting modeling workshop series. The next one will be, uh, the seventh one will be in Bergen, if you're interested. This was this is really what this community is, is meeting on an annual basis. Um, please reach out to me or you can click on the, the email address or the website down there and you should, should be able to find more information. Next. And with that, I want, just want to conclude. Three, three things I wanted to, to remember from this talk. The first one is really uh, don't expect that everything gets immediately better if you go to high resolution. Some things might even get worse. And that's probably for a good reason, because you, you make it much harder to tune the models. Like uh, often deep convection schemes are used to tune out um, errors in the model. If you take out, if you take away this tuning parameter, you really see what's going on in the model. And then often you have to go and see what processes are missing, like the soil atmosphere coupling that we, I showed you earlier. Next. I'm really excited about this this whole area of research. Um, I think it really revolutionized our ability to understand the water cycle and to project it into the future. Um, and this 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 area is very fast growing, and um, I can see that this this global vision is I think really in reach within the next five to ten years. And next, what I also see is that there's lots of opportunities to better coordinate between different global projects like Clivar, GWAX, but also the Digital Earth or the, the lighthouse activities. So if, if you're interested to join a conversation, I know you're already in contact with Andrew Gettleman, but I think this would be really fantastic to get your feedback on what we are doing and to try to start um, talking more frequently. Next, and with this, I want to thank you and just show you a beautiful animation using the MPES model at uh, four kilometer globally, uh, showing you the cloud field and the temperature field on the right. Next. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for, for a very nice presentation. So unfortunately, we do not have enough time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have missed uh, your third part on model bias. Uh, <laughs> actually, we are also quite interesting. I, I would so, like, I hope like you could get access to the slides. Like Sam has those slides. Maybe he can make them available to the whole group if you want. Yeah, to yeah, that'd be great. Share them in our drive and I'll, I'll send out an email to the panel after uh, after we're done here. Thank you so much. Like. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we go to the uh, question session. Anyone have questions? Uh, Ruby, I see you have your hand up. Hey, yes. A great presentation, Andres. Really, really oh, thank interesting. you, Ruby. I, I really like that study, the Balage et al. study, because, like you said, as atmospheric scientists, we always try to fix the problem from the atmospheric perspective. Like, oh, let's change microphysics and the, and things like that. And and we do also find that changing the land surface model is much more effective in addressing the warm biases in in the central United States. So we have been working with the causes uh, project to look into this. But we we find that there are multiple ways to to address this problem by changing the land surface model. It doesn't necessarily have to be the convergence of the subsurface lateral flow, but it could be also be any other processes that might affect the evapotranspiration. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how, how do you know that um, or maybe you have already confirmed that those processes that were added in that particular paper were indeed the important processes that increased the ET that led to the, the reduced uh, temperature bias. And then, sorry, related to this question, I, I really wanted to also um, 
uh, ask for your comments about how can we better make use of observation data to help with high resolution modeling because we could make all these changes that help to reduce the model biases, but whether those processes are indeed the ones that, that are responsible. Uh, I'm not so, so sure that we have observation data enough to really constrain the, the model for that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I go with the first question and like what we did, like this is really specific for the wolf model. I, I have to say, like we didn't test this actually not even in the MPAS model, if we, even though we could do this now, um, but in the wolf model, if you turn off this lateral flow or you turn it on, this is basically it's, it's, it's full five degrees temperature difference and probably 30, 40% of the rainfall that you get more. And it's, it's really through this evapotranspiration, as you said. So it would be interesting to see what you find, like which other um, processes there. But I fully agree. What initially, what what we, how we basically understood that this is related to the land surfaces. We we use NOAA MP as the as the land surface model, and we turned we switched it to NOAA, like the easier model, and we got a massive response. Like if you change the land surface model in 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 your modeling system, you will get a very diff you might get a very different climate in the central US. So. That's really one of these hotspots where land atmosphere coupling is 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 dominating, and like just it's really stag staggering. Oh, like for me, it was very surprising how much this moisture recycling is affecting right. the region. Because traditionally, often you think it's the low level jet you get the moisture transport from right. the Gulf. That that's not the whole story. Like it's really both of these combined. Um, I fully agree with you with the observations. Like. Especially once you get into the surface modeling, there are very few observations, groundwater um, observations, for example. It was very difficult to evaluate that what we're doing is, is realistic or not. But even like I think what, for example, DOE, ASR um, is doing with, with the ARM campaigns, I think those are very good efforts. Like if you if you know you have certain biases in your model and then you Try to address them with these kind of field campaigns. I think that's that's really very helpful, um, even if it's just shorter periods. Um, and this is also what we try to do in this digital Earth lighthouse activity to identify common model biases in these high resolution models and potentially also connect them to observations more. Yeah, I think it would be really useful for um, the kind of measurements like. Like you, you, you brought up the, uh, the arm measurements. They are really, really useful. But if those kind of measurements can be combined with some measurements below the surface, right? Because mm -hmm. we can change all these processes that increase the ET, but which ones <laughs> are actually yeah. the real processes? But oftentimes, a few campaigns or measurements were only focusing on either the atmosphere or the land or, 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 or some particular portion of the Earth system. So I think these kind of like interactions are really. I fully agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great talk. Yeah. Thank you, Ruby. Mike. Hi. Very nice talk. Um, just a couple quick questions. One, um, in terms of the U.S. modeling centers that are um, working with models at the one kilometer level, your list that you provided a few slides toward the end. I didn't see GFDL on that list. Their sphere no. model activity yeah. is that. Is that an omission, or are they part of the the groups, the group that's participating in these annual workshops? No, no. This is basically me forgetting to add them. But thanks okay. for like this is this is not yeah. like this is yeah. not a complete list. But this is a good point. We should add them definitely. I do have another question though about um, the application um, in other regions. So you talked about um, the Western U.S. When we look at the Southwest monsoon, where we have this complex interaction of um, the ocean atmosphere interaction off the coast, um, processes on the shelf, um, the low level jet there, um, up the Gulf of, um, uh, what is it, the Gulf of California. Good point, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then the orography all interplaying and the land surface processes as well. Is there, um, I noticed on one of your early slides that there are uh, significant biases in the same direction that you see over the Great Plains in that region as well. Have you guys targeted that as a, kind of a case study as well or are there plans to do so yeah we should definitely focus more on this region specifically we, we looked at the region as one of many regions and uh, what we see is of course like often even in summertime like convection is often associated with topography in the area so we get those patterns generally better 
but we definitely overestimate rainfall in the monsoon region, and we don't really know why. And like again, like we, for example, this is this is a fairly simple models that we're still running. Like nothing is coupled to the ocean, so it's all sea surface temperature observed. And, uh, this would be very interesting to focus there and really try to understand this ocean atmosphere and atmosphere coupling in this region. Thanks. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Our question regarding uh, this Mexico convective uh, presentation, you have shown uh, several factors like groundwater flow, uh, increased model resolution. I assume they, you have turned off this uh, deep convection uh, for the four kilometer simulations. But you know, uh, for most of us, uh, even the climate centers, we cannot afford a four kilometer simulation for climate studies. So based on your results, whether you can have some idea or hints what is a potential problem within the convection parameterization, whether it's uh, possible we can have a better improve the massive scale commercial sim simulations uh, within like a 25 kilometers model, if that possible? Yeah, the, like Ruby probably could answer this question as well. Like there's there's a couple of ideas that people are working on. One of them is super parameterizations or this multi-scale cloud framework that people are using where you have basically a cloud model within each grid cell and you replace the deep convection scheme with that. That can help a little bit, but it's not solving everything. Um, Mitch Monkry, for example, he's a colleague at Ankara. I'm not sure if you know Mitch, but he worked on the parameterization of MCS circulation. And that's very interesting because what, what an MCS is really is, it's a slantwise overturning circulation. So it's, it's really a massive ma uh, momentum and moisture transport over many grid cells, which you cannot produce by, or which are not accounted for by traditional deep convection schemes. Like deep convection schemes are working in the, in the vertical, but they don't really interact across diff the different grid spaces uh, grid cells and i know that they have some interesting results there as well i think he's working with doe scientists and in implementing his ideas um so there are ideas how to improve deep convection mesoscale convective or convective organization in these models um and high resolution th i think high resolution is a very promising one but also as again like in the doe screen model for example they they get very few MCSs in the tropics. They get this popcorn convection. We still don't understand why, if they go to high resolution. So again, like high resolution is not the solution to everything immediately, but it's probably for the long term, next 10 years, I think this is where I see many of this um, research is going to. Okay, thank you. Can I just add maybe yeah. one or two comments? I, I think Andre has gave a very good uh, response to that. Um, for for me, I am actually not giving up on lower resolution model. I think there is still a very big role for that, and and people have been experimenting with different ways to improve parameterizations. And and also, I mean, because we always facilitated our idea on, like improving the atmosphere model without recognizing actually the land model is also very important. So I think making advances in both of these would be important. Um, so uh, Andreas mentioned about the uh, Mitch um, parameterization, which is called MCSP. We find that it does actually improve uh, simulation of MCS a lot over the tropics, but unfortunately not over the US, suggesting that model biases in different regions are also quite diff perhaps have different sources as well. So, but in any case, I, I, I think that uh, very high, I mean, while we fix, try to fix the problem with lower resolution model, there's a lot we can learn from high resolution model. I think these should kind of like Mm -hmm. Go in parallel. That's a good point. Thank you, Ruby. Yeah, thank you, Ruby. Michelle? You're muted. I lowered my hand, but didn't unmute myself. Anyway, this is a very nice talk. Um, really liked your animations, help make it more real. Um, so I assume that you're making these model runs after some period of spin up and then looking at the the statistics of that. Okay. Um, is there any attempt here or in the future to look at initialization? Mm, definitely. Yeah. So the, the 40 years, this was really interesting in the 40 year simulation. 
we offline spin up the soil moisture. Like it's mostly the soil moisture that we are concerned with. Like the atmosphere spins up very quickly. Uh, soil moisture, soil temperature. In this 40 year long simulations, we see even after six or seven years that the, the soil moisture is not in equilibrium in the desert Southwest. Like it's really in the arid, arid regions, like in the humid regions, you spin up fairly quickly. This is our experience. In the arid regions, it takes a long time. And um, like the first five, six years, you have to be careful. We don't see this propagating into the atmosphere. So you don't see any trends in temperature or precipitation, low level temperature, but you definitely see this spin ups in the soil moisture um, states and the soil fluxes. Um, so this is definitely something we want to improve in future simulations, but it's it's very costly to spin those models up at this grid spacing. So you probably want to have some alternative approaches. Yeah, I, I'd be personally very curious how feasible this is um, in an initialized space. Um, yeah. So it, it, that, that I think is an important question. Yeah, and like even thinking one step further, if you think about ocean atmosphere coupling, you you have the same issue. Like, how do you spin up the ocean? And I know that multiple multiple modeling centers are working on this, and it's it's a challenging topic. Well, and, and how are you going to initialize the land if if the if you have this really strong dependence uh, on something which is almost unknowable? Yeah. I mean, are you better off not going to such high resolution and just trying to treat all of us stochastically in some or in some statistical sense? Does that argue for not not going to resolution this high uh, when you're uh, interested in prediction as as we are uh, here? Yeah, like for for you, if you're really interested in prediction, like the other, like a sample size is often a critical. Point. Like we, these are all deterministic runs as well. Like we can only afford to do one of those. They sometimes take a year to run. Um, so there's definitely a trade-off between model resolution and ensemble size. And then I fully agree with you. Like the spin-up. Um, the normally what we do is we we use observa observed fluxes at the so at the surface and run the land surface model online for hundreds of years, which is very quick to do. It's cheap. And then you spin up the soil conditions this way, but they are not really like these are often biased fields and they are not really the same field since the model is biased. So they're not in equilibrium with what the model is simulating. So you have drifts at the beginning again. So yeah, there's, I think we don't have the answer to this either. All right. I, I guess I'll, I'll just take the prerogative to ask one more uh, question, uh, especially kind of seen a number of recent talks and, and a large number of sessions at AMS. I mean, I guess one could make a counter argument that that maybe, and some people are starting to do this, right? That the days of of uh, numerical models are maybe they're, if not coming to an end, they're being supplanted and that a lot of the computational and resource and ultimately funding effort uh, maybe should be uh, directed uh, in large part towards machine learning approaches. Uh, and certainly uh, for these kind of models, you know, you could imagine doing machine learning basically in each grid spell cell, right? A model and a model. So what would be your response? <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I'm excited about machine learning as well. I, mm -hmm. I don't see this either or. I think an and solution would be probably the best to use mas machine learning and these kind of models and maybe machine learning in the models to improve, for example, specific um, parameterization schemes or speed them up. My, my like machine learning, one issue that I can see with machine learning is it, like day to day weather forecasting might be okay, but extremes. It's but like by definition, you need a large data set to train these models. And if they don't have good physical constraints, once you go to extreme events, you, you have very limited data that you can train the model on. And then it's the question if they can can realistically simulate those events. And especially especially into the future where you go into regimes that you probably haven't observed. So again, like I think a combination of physical, a physical modeling and machine learning approach to me sounds the most promising into the future. 